Welcome back to another one of Mr. Lang's vlogs. Today we're talking about the Vietnam War, a war that truly did shape a generation. So let's get started. So a quick overview about the Vietnam War is that it was the longest war in U.S. history uh, until recently. Uh, more than 58,000 are going to be killed, uh, 300,000 are going to be wounded, uh, 14,000 um, are going to be disabled after this war, and altogether 800,000 Vietnam veterans are going to be diagnosed with uh, severe or significant problems of readjustment or PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and this number continues to grow. Again, that's for us. But over in Vietnam, it's a little bit of a different story. It's a much, much bigger death toll over there with uh, over 2 million dead. Uh, and of course, uh, 4 million wounded, 10 million displaced from their homes. So there definitely is a big impact of the people that are also in Vietnam due to this war. Uh, it's a very different type of war than even World War II or other ones we've talked about, and that is a living room war, meaning that people saw this war uh, unfold, watched the footage of combat on the nightly news as it was happening. And this is really where television does play a major role for the first time in a war. So a little bit of background on the war is that Vietnam was originally French Indochina, uh, which was a French colony that was invaded by the Japanese during World War II. Uh, a leader by the name of Ho Chi Minh uh, of the Vietnamese, uh, called the Viet Minh, uh, is going to go ahead and take over um, the uh, North Vietnam here. Um, he's going to support communism. Uh, and again, as you remember, our real big push when it comes to communism is to contain it because of that domino theory. Again, where one would fall, one country would fall to communism, others would as well. So, in 1945, the French return to control Vietnam, and Ho Chi Minh controls North Vietnam and is going to be sent aid by China in 1945. France is going to be sent aid by the United States. And by 1950, President Truman is going to send over $15 million in aid to France to help with this war that was already going on. Uh, the United States is actually paying around 75 to 80% of France's military expenses at the beginning of this. And we technically aren't even involved yet. So why did we get involved? Why did the U.S. get involved? Well, first, President Truman's policy of containment. Like I said, the American policy of resisting any type of further expansion of communism around the world into different countries. So again, we wanted to contain communism where it was. And the other is Eisenhower's domino theory where the belief that if one country were to fall to communism, the other neighboring countries would fall as well and fall like dominoes. So again, looking at Vietnam, we have a lot of other uh, countries around that could potentially fall to communism, such as Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, uh, and so on. At this point, China has already fallen to communism. So you see why it was a very hot spot here, where they wanted to not only contain communism, but prevent it from spreading. And so France is actually in trouble. In fact, in 1954, you have Operation Vulture, which basically France wants the U.S. to use the atomic bomb uh, on, on the, in the Vietnam War. Uh, Eisenhower says no. And then May 1954 is Dien Bien Phu, which France holds the area for around 50 days, and then it falls to Ho Chi Minh and his men. Uh, this is a major turning point for the French here, because eventually the French are going to start to pull out of Vietnam after this defeat. But we've already gone ahead and invested a lot in here. Um, and of course, we see that because we've invested a lot, we're not willing to leave. Uh, by 1954, we have the Geneva Accords, which again divides officially Vietnam into two separate halves um, near the 17th parallel, where you have North Vietnam, controlled by Ho Chi Minh, and South Vietnam, who's going to be looking for a leader. Um, and again, looking for that leader is going to be very important. So we have the two leaders. Ho Chi Minh, he's our first leader of the North. Uh, also, many in South Vietnam actually look to him to for leadership, which is important as, of course, we're going to be fighting on the side of South Vietnam when you get involved in this war against North Vietnam. Uh, yet, there's going to be some South Vietnamese that really, truly... Um, essentially are, are, are not really for us, the U.S. being there, uh, and instead kind of look to us as invaders, as we were. Uh, he's going to be a hero because he is going to break up those these large estates um, and redistribute land to peasants, uh, very similar to how we see, you know, what we saw in China. 
uh, and he had beaten the French. So a lot of Vietnamese, North and South, both really looked up to this guy. We put in Nho Dien Diem, and when we put him into power, in uh, which he was literally placed in power in South Vietnam, it's going to be very controversial. So when Diem is actually in charge in South Vietnam, uh, he was told to hold free elections. Uh, later, he refuses that. It was a very corrupt government uh, that suppressed any type of opposition and offered little to no land distribution to peasants. So it was no wonder that the South Vietnamese definitely looked more towards their North Vietnamese leader, Ho Chi Minh, than their leader in South Vietnam, Ngo Dien Diem, that, we put, that the U.S. put in power. Uh, he is Catholic believe it or not, uh, in a country that is mainly Buddhist. Um, and he's going to restrict Buddhist practices across South Vietnam, something that, again, just wasn't right that he was doing. And it's going to be a problem. Um, because of that, in 1957, we have the Viet Cong, or the VC that the Americans refer to them as. Um, these are guerrilla war uh, fighters that want to DM out of South Vietnam. In fact, they're from South Vietnam themselves. So this is where the war gets a little uh, complicated because the United States is going to be uh, aiding South Vietnam from the invading North Vietnam. North Vietnam has the NVA as their, arm, as their army, or known as the Viet Minh. The South has the Viet Cong, which are going to be helping out the North Vietnamese army. So, yeah, we are also fighting South Vietnamese in this war as well. And the way they communicate, again, the, v the Viet Minh or the NVA, um, North Vietnamese Army, in the north and the Viet Cong in the south is through the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, the Ho Chi Minh Trail is a network of paths used by the North Vietnamese to transport supplies to the Viet Cong in South Vietnam. Um, altogether, 300,000 people are going to work full-time to maintain this trail, as of course, uh, oftentimes, the Americans and others uh, are going to sabotage this trail whenever they can. So, there's a lot of trouble for Diem in his leadership in South Vietnam. To protest uh, Diem, Buddhist monks set themselves on fire, very famously, these, uh, you may have seen the photos, and, you know, because of that, because of how he's you know, we put the wrong guy in power, essentially, in South Vietnam, things are getting even worse, uh, to the point where more South Vietnamese, again, the people we, you know, are trying to keep uh, from turning communist, are going to start gaining support. Uh, you know, the VC, uh, the, v the Viet Cong, is going to gain support from South Vietnamese civilians, because, again, they see that their government is pretty corrupt. So what ends up happening is Diem is going to be out. Uh, the U.S. supports a military coup to take over Diem and get him out of power. Uh, again, this is under JFK. In fact, November 1st, 1963, Diem is executed. Um, again, by the U.S. Uh, and what we see is that, of course, just, what, 22 days later, uh, you're going to have JFK be assassinated as well. Again, another conspiracy theory. Um, General William Westmoreland, who's very famous, uh, is going to be the overall commander of Vietnam for the U.S. during this conflict. Um, now we see that under a new president, after the assassination of JFK, we had involvement in Vietnam, but we weren't full troops on the ground involved under JFK. It is going to be under LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson, that we are going to go ahead and have troops on the ground in Vietnam, like massive, like a massive amount of troops. Uh, so LBJ does escalate this war uh, and escalates the U.S. involvement altogether. Um, again, during this time, you have the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, who's going to serve under Kennedy and Johnson um, and recommending that the U.S. send more troops in the conflict in Vietnam. Uh, was that the correct decision? Well, that's a very, very controversial uh, stance uh, right there. As some people think yes, some people think no, and we're going to be getting into that. So in August of 1964, really this sparks the escalation to include more troops, troops on the ground um, in Vietnam. Like again, a massive amount of troops on the ground. And that is the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Uh, essentially the ship, the USS Maddox, which is a US ship, is going to be attacked by North Vietnamese torpedo boats. When it is, 
two days later, um, the ship Sea Turn of Joy is supposedly fired upon. So LBJ asked Congress to act. This was his opportunity to say, hey, we're getting attacked from a foreign nation. Congress, you guys can declare war. What are we going to do? And so they come up with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. So it's still not a declaration of war. And that's what's important about the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. It gave LBJ uh, essentially a blank check to go ahead and do whatever steps he deemed necessary to repeal any type of attacks. Again, in fact, to give it, to quote it, this law gave Johnson the authority to all, to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against forces of the United States. Again, very vague, but again, on purpose, it's very vague. Um, and this declaration really is what starts the Vietnamese conflict for us here in the US, for your average infantry that are gonna be on the ground. And of course, because of that, we are gonna institute the draft. So in 1965, the US military institutes what they call a draft, which is a lottery of random picking of eligible young men to join the military. It was oftentimes based on your birthday. Uh, and there were ways to get out of the draft, but it was very controversial as well. Um, again, mainly poor males um, due to college deferments are going to be in this draft. And, well, although this did help with the growing demand for troops in Vietnam, it's going to have a huge backlash as well against these uh, against the war. Um, as there is going to be the burning of draft cards, as you can see in the picture below, um, in protest of this war. So how do they pick the lottery? Well, here you go. I kind of put it all in one big summary of words here. So let me kind of like sum it up for you. So basically, uh, they would do this, this kind of randomness where in the days of the year, right? So February, including February 29th, mind you, um, they're represented by numbers one through 366. And that would be written on slips of paper. So then the slips are gonna be placed in a separate plastic capsule mixed in a shoebox, basically, dumped into a deep glass jar, uh, and these capsules are gonna be drawn from the jar one at a time. So for example, the first number was drawn, uh, if it was drawn 258, that would be September 14th. So all registrants with that birthday were gonna be assigned lottery number one. The second number drawn upon, April 24th, uh, and so forth. So all men of the draft age, born from 44 to 1950, uh, who shared a birthday would be called to serve at once. Uh, so the first 195 birth dates drawn were later called to serve in the order that they were drawn. The last of these was September 24th. Also, December 1st, 1969, they had a second lottery uh, with 26 letters of the alphabet. And there, you, among the men with the same birth date, the order of induction was determined by the permutation ranks of the first letter of their last, first, and middle names. So anyone with initials JJJ would have been first within the shared birth date. Anyone with initials VVV would have been last. Confusing, right? And that's exactly the point. Um, the way they pick the lottery, they try to do it the fairest. But essentially, first they're going to pick you by your birthday, and then eventually they're going to start picking you by uh, ranked in that in that day by your initials. Again, first letters of your last, first, and middle names. Um, this is crazy, uh, but this is what they have to do for the draft. Because of all of this madness going on, there's a huge anti-war movement, um, a huge amount of opposition to the war. Um, you're gonna have first the war hawks, the hawks that are gonna support the war, and you're gonna have the doves, I think doves means peace, they're gonna be opposed to the war. Um, and that's that's really what we see here, you know, really the two um, butt heads throughout this, this time because of this. Now, how did you avoid the draft? Well, there really were three different ways, um, amongst others too, but these are gonna be the three main ones. First, you have conscientious objectors who basically claim that because of their religious beliefs, they couldn't fight. You have deferments, uh, which could be essentially delayed entrance or not having to go at all. And it depends on what you could have. You could have a medical deferment, maybe a heart murmur or something like that, or you could have a um, education deferment. Again, you were in college, so if you, you know, essentially if you could afford college, again, you could avoid the war. Uh, and then you have the option to, well, even the option to even get to go to jail, again, for dodging the draft, or even 
going ahead and going to Canada, which some did to dodge the draft. They went to Canada. They left the country. So the war starts to escalate. Um, and again, it escalates through a couple different means. First is Operation Rolling Thunder. Uh, this is going to be an intense bombing of North Vietnam, um, almost constant bombing. Uh, basically, it was meant to weaken the enemy's will to fight and assure that the South Vietnamese, uh, that the U.S. was there and committed to them to help beat back the North so the North didn't invade the South. So basically, it really was two, twofold. Again, we were trying to break the spirits of the North Vietnamese and show the South Vietnamese that we were on their side. The main target, obviously, was the Ho Chi Minh Trail, again, where they were supplying the South Vietnamese. So this is actually going to lead to, talk about a backlash, lead to a lot of South Vietnamese joining the Viet Cong. The reason why is because they're seeing literally Vietnamese people getting bombed because of all of this. There's also going to be the use of defoliants and napalm during this war. Uh, Agent Orange, for example, is going to be used to expose jungle supply lines, um, enemy hiding places, and poison enemy food supplies. Um, that's pretty horrible, but true. Um, again, this is a very, very uh, toxic chemical, and it's toxic to the people, uh, you know, the people it lands on as well. Uh, U.S. palms would drop something called napalm as well. This is a gasoline-based bomb that would set fire to the jungle. So literally, they would set parts of the jungle on fire. Um, they would expose, um, use Agent Orange to kill the kill the plants as well, so then they could see things. But again, they're killing also the really the environment, the natural environment of the, of Vietnam. And so the the war kind of like it takes a turn here. So Agent Orange is also going to be used uh, as a leaf killing toxic chemical that devastated the landscape. And so the U.S. is going to dump over 13 million gallons of this stuff in via along, all along Vietnam. You know, the name comes from the orange barrels that contain the chemical. Um, and of course, this was under the Battles for Hearts and Minds movement during this, during this war. Um, but what heart? What heart? You know, the U.S. did not win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese by doing this. Why? We burned their villages. We killed their livestock. And we used chemicals that caused skin disease, birth defects, and even cancer. Uh, people that still live with this today. Um, as you can see the picture of the victims here. By using these harsh chemicals um, that not only got, you know, on them, but also into their food supply, into their water as well. Um, again, it's it's horrible here because as they, they put that we are battling for the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people, um, it's just it's just not true. It's not it's it's really you know what heart really. So we see a huge escalation as well again in this war. In 1965, we had 200,000 troops in Vietnam. By 1967, we had Operation Cedar Falls, where the U.S. actually attacked a Viet Cong headquarters in the Iron Triangle. And we thought that that was going to be a pretty successful way to, you know, kind of start to close out um, this war, at least with the Viet Cong. Um, but what we instead find is that troops start to uncover a massive underground tunnel complex that was used for guerrilla raids. Again, these, these the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese were tunneling underground. Um, and because of that, they were labeled as tunnel rats. Again, men responsible for going down on the tunnels to flush out the VC. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. If you can imagine, U.S. soldiers are going to start to go into these tunnels um, that are very small and have many traps in them. Um, and what they would do is they would, these tunnel rats would go ahead and try to flush out the Viet Cong out of these tunnels. Now, these tunnels were small, they were dark, and they were dangerous. In fact, when I say they were like an ant farm, I mean, just look at the picture here. Again, this is a typical Viet Cong tunnel complex. It is like an ant farm where there's all sorts of different rooms and everything else dug out. Um, these men were underground fighting. And again, they it was hard to even fit in some of these as well as there were a lot of different uh, traps in here as well. On top of this, we start search and destroy missions, uh, which is the attempt to drive the Viet Cong from their hideouts. And first we would locate the enemy, call in air support, then we would send in patrols to really find the last of the Viet Cong in the area. 
However, a lot of them are going to be in the tunnels. And a huge, huge event in this war does happen January 31st, 1968 with the Tet Offensive. The Tet Offensive um, is the new year. The Tet is the new year for the Vietnamese. So you have 70,000 uh, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong attack cities all across South Vietnam all at once. Very organized. Something that we didn't expect because we didn't think that they were all they were that organized. But they were. This was by far the boldest move they had made yet. And with the Viet Cong even attacking the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam, killing five American soldiers. Mind you, killing these soldiers on TV. On TV, this was being broadcasted. You know, this is a huge turning point in the war. And I can't stress that enough. The reason why it's a turning point is because this was a technically a military victory for the U.S., but a psychological victory for the Viet Cong. They knew they struck, and when they struck, they got they ambushed us. We didn't expect it. The U.S. didn't expect it at all. And because of that, we are going to see that they are way more organized. And we under we have been underestimating them this whole time. Um, again, um, the American public also saw this, and they thought the U.S. was winning the war until they see this on TV. You know, they watched as Americans were killed in the U.S. Embassy. Uh, they watched when. You know, a South Vietnamese uh, general uh, shoots a prisoner point blank on television, live, as you can see here. You know, it proved that the Viet Cong were strong and determined in their mission. So, it also created a what we call a credibility gap. You know, few Americans are going to start to trust the government because the government's saying, hey, we're winning this war, but that's not what they're seeing on TV. In fact, another reason, President Johnson said he would halt the bombing of North Vietnam but that's not the whole truth. The government is, again, lying. And President Johnson even announced that he would not seek re-election. This war really did a number to LBJ. And so our next president uh, is going to be Richard Nixon. Again, you have the My Lai Massacre, where in March 16, 1968, we have U.S. troops going ahead and searching out for the enemy, uh, which they deemed Charlie. And that, you're going to hear that term often. Uh, when they talk about Viet Cong, um, they're going to call. They're going to be looking for Charlie, which is just another name for the enemy. What happens is we have 300 civilians, mostly old men, women, and children, are going to be killed by this U.S. by these U.S. troops. Um, and you know, one of the pilots are going to report the killings to the U.S. headquarters because it's not right. They're killing civilians, innocent civilians, defenseless civilians. And what happens here is that, you know, very famously we have the, um, you know, these photographs and these pictures are going to be released. And this is where, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, Viet the Vietnam uh, soldiers are going to be labeled as baby killers um, by the public. And that's because of these pictures, because of what these men did. Um, again, and it's horrible, absolutely horrible what these men did, but it didn't represent all troops in Vietnam. And so after me Lai... Many Americans are going to view those veterans as, uh, unfortunately, uh, baby killers. We have the anti-war movement going on at home as well, a counterculture movement, if you will, uh, where basically people are going to be, you know, mainly teenagers um, and 20-year-olds, and you know, young, young men and women that are going to go against traditional American norms. Um, you know, the counterculture is basically against the establishment, against government. Uh, large corporations and so on. Again, this is the 60s. Um, and this group often was white middle class college students, but not all the time. Um, as there were African Americans in the movement, uh, as well as, um, you know, also, you know, not middle class, you know, lower class and upper class um, as well. There's going to be huge protests on college campuses. Uh, we have SDS, again, Students for a Democratic Society. It's going to be a radical group formed on major colleges to help protest the Vietnam War. They basically want an end to all those RTC programs that are at colleges trying to recruit more people to enter the war. And so what we see on May 4th, 1970 is in Kent State University, located in Ohio, is a shooting um, because students were upset at President Nixon's order to have troops go into Cambodia, a neighboring country to Vietnam. Uh, in, in, in South Vietnam. And so the students are going to burn the ROTC building in a protest. 
and the government of of Ohio is going to impose martial law, um, which is basically the military rules temporarily, and it's imposed on civilians. So he called out the Ohio National Guard in the students' protest. The National Guard throws tear tear gas at students, and the students throw rocks at the National Guard. Minutes later, they do open fire, and four students are going to be shot. Uh, these four students right here. Um, as the song goes, it's very famous, there's going to be four dead in Ohio. Now, President Nixon handles the war, uh, and it really does define his presidency as well. He's elected in 1968 after Johnson does not go for re-election, and he said he represented the silent majority, which are those individuals that did not demonstrate against the war, speak out against the government, but essentially... Um, supported the war effort and so he promised to start bringing the boys home from Vietnam however his approach was a little flawed he does something called Vietnamization uh, now Vietnamization is basically the gradual withdrawal of US troops and training for the South Vietnam army so they can go ahead and take more control of the war again basically easing us out of the war uh, he said it would cease bombing not the whole truth uh, and of course, especially during Operation Linebacker, where he bombs Cambodia to cut the supply lines of the Viet Cong. Again, he's bombing another country. So we see that that's going to be definitely more of an international issue. Again, he his policy of peace with honor was essentially Nixon's way of wanting to maintain the U.S. dignity in the face of withdrawal from the war. You know, the U.S. hasn't really lost war here. Uh, and so, of course, this is something he really wants. It's peace with honor. Save face for the U.S. as we withdraw, because we're not going to win. We also have a lot of POWs, or prisoners of war. Uh, from 1964 to 1973, the North Vietnamese are going to capture Americans, uh, mostly pilots, crews of downed aircraft, and deliver them to these prisons. Um, we, there are still very much a large amount of unaccounted for uh, prisoners of war, from Vietnam and so they start for home operation frequent wind is uh, the largest evacuation on record here um, we start moving all Americans from Saigon and on April 30th 1975 um, even though our troops are out for the most part by 1973 the majority of our troops are out of Vietnam um, on April 30th in 75 Saigon Falls the capital of South Vietnam Falls to North Vietnam now Saigon is still to this day renamed Ho Chi Minh City, and Vietnam is all united under communism. There's no more North Vietnam and South Vietnam, it's just now Vietnam, and it's all communist. So we had a lot of different policy change. In 1973, we had the War Powers Act, which is going to limit the president's power to engage troops in undeclared wars. Um, again, this is a direct result because of the Gulf of Tonkin incident, um, and again, the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. Uh, basically, you must notify Congress within 48 hours of sending troops abroad. And American troops may not remain abroad longer than 60 days without congressional approval. Again, this is a way to go ahead and put more of a um, leash, if you will, on that very vague Gulf of Tonkin resolution for, that was given to LBJ. Uh, you also have in 1971 the Constitutional Amendment number 26, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18. So now we have young men who were being drafted at 18 but couldn't vote. Now they have a say. Now they could vote. In 1971, we have something called the Pentagon Papers, which we're going to get more into later. These documents are going to reveal that the government had misled people about the course of the war over the entirety of it. Uh, and in fact, it becomes very controversial during Nixon's era, especially because it's going to show, again, another reason why people started to not believe the government. Again, this painful legacy that this war has left is 58,000 killed here in the U.S., uh, 365,000 wounded. Uh, between North and South Vietnam, over 1.5 million deaths. Um, a lot of delayed stress syndrome, um, which is post-traumatic stress disorder now, which with recurring nightmares and, and, and things like that. You know, in 1982, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C. gets made. And if you've ever been there, it's it's... It's beautiful for what it is. It's, it shows the names of, of, the, of the men who served. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's very 
it's very moving it's very moving for sure as this is a big part of our history as americans um, that you know even to this day you, know, you may know some vietnam veterans um, that served or you know maybe someone in your family had served um, this, this still was very much in our memory um, but on that somber note that's what we got for you for today so thank you for joining us we'll catch you back in the classroom <laughs>